Hello, I'm Tony DeMario, the editor of Jack, here highlighting some very interesting articles from the October 16th issue of the journal. One of the major issues we all face in cardiology is the non-responder to cardiac resynchronization therapy, CRT. And we know this happens in about a third of cases. And so a group of investigators in the Midwest hypothesized that frequent PVCs might in fact contribute to the non-response to CRT. And so from uh, a, a group of over 1,000 patients, they identified 65 non-responders to CRT who had very, very frequent PVCs. They then undertook to uh, do ablation of the PVCs, which was successful overall in, in about 90% of cases. And what they observed was that following successful ablation of the PVCs, that there was a dramatic increase in left ventricular volumes, in left ventricular ejection fraction, and in particular, left ventricular end systolic volume. So, I, I mean, what we can take from these data are that PVCs, uh, especially if they're frequent, may in fact be one of the mechanisms by which CRT is unsuccessful, and ablating those PVCs may in fact convert those patients to responders. The number they came up with was about 22% of all beats being PVCs as a threshold for a patient who's very likely to benefit. Uh, perhaps an answer to at least a subset of those patients who don't respond initially to cardiac resynchronization. The mechanism of hypertension continues to be elusive, and in an interesting study in Jack, a group of investigators from the Mayo Clinic evaluated the role of natriuretic peptides, uh, BNP, NT pro BNP, and ANP, uh, as possible etiologic agents in hypertension. And in a group of, of over 2,000 patients from Rochester, Minnesota that they followed, what they observed was that BNP and NT pro-BNP levels were reduced in patients who had prehypertension, and in fact, in those patients, there was no compensatory increase in ANP. Now, later in the course of hypertension, those natriuretic peptide levels were increased, but in prehypertensives, uh, uh, they were very definitely decreased, an unexpected finding. This, of course, presents a potential therapeutic target. It's intriguing to think perhaps if we can increase uh, BNP, NT pro BNP levels levels in prehypertensive patients, we may be able to avoid the ravages of hypertension. Now, one of the important parameters of cardiac function that we strive to measure is absolute myocardial perfusion. There's a couple techniques to do that, uh, N N13 ammonium uh, uh, PET, positron emission tomography, or gadolinium en enhanced cardiac magnetic resonance. And so uh, in this issue of Jack, we have a comparison of these two techniques. And in fact, what was observed was that in terms of absolute myocardial blood flow, and we're talking now about milliliters per minute per gram of myocardium, that the two techniques only correlated weakly. Uh, uh, Clearly, some technical refinements are, are required uh, to uh, get better absolute measurements. But what they were very, very good at was identifying coronary artery stenoses. And in doing re receiver operator curves, it was identified that the myocardial perfusion reserve, as, as calculated by these two techniques, yielded values of about 0.83 uh, for the uh, ROC curve, uh, a, a very, very respectable value. And in fact, uh, using a cutoff of about 1.4 for myocardial perfusion reserve, uh, values below that had a sensitivity and a specificity in the, in the mid-8 range, 0.8 range, for both techniques, very comparable, very similar. So while it appears that we're still not quite there in terms of the measurement of absolute myocardial perfusion, both techniques are comparable and of value in identifying coronary lesions. 
I'm pleased to have shared with you some very interesting articles from the October 16th issue of Jack. Thanks for watching.